the, the federal judge is going to come back. Federal judge is going to come back. And uh, here's your case number. It's 12 CV 123. That's what the clerk puts on your paperwork. The judge is going to come back and he's going to answer you 12 CV lowercase 0123. It's a different case number. Or they're going to come back and say C12123. That's another case number. Then they're going to come back CV120123. Lowercase CV120123. Twelve, uh, uppercase CV, zero, one, two, three. These are all, then you're going to say, well, this is, this, this is the case number here. No, all these are different case numbers. Now, if you had taken one of these and put them as the key to get into your computer, you think that any of these are going to open up your computer except the correct one? Same thing is true when you go looking for the case number at the courthouse. They punch that in there, they're not going to find your case number. Then they're going to say, well, you paid 350 bucks for this case number, and they dismissed your case under this one. Or the judge sent, come to court with this number. The lawyer filed this one. The lawyer answered back to this one. The judge dismissed your case with this one, and they want you to come into court to arbitrate this one when this is your original number. Okay, once your original number is filed, we run 45-day trust law and three-day rescissions. Once the, those 48 days go by, you have now a document, contract, I mean, I, uh, a fault document contract claim, four words, writ of the fault document contract claim. We filed the lawsuit. We filed the correct parse syntax grammar. We took the Let's see here. There it is. This here is your deed of trust to your property here in Indiana. And we identified every single word by placing a number on top of it. All 6,000 words. So we couldn't, if we, take, if we take this document and write the word adjective on top of the word red, we wouldn't have enough space, right? So we use the number three in place of it. When we do numbers, you can read 300 words a second when it comes time to correct this document. You know that? Just takes a little bit of practice, and all of a sudden, like you're aware, you can read 300 words a second in number codes. The mind can comprehend 10,000 thoughts a second. So, doing 300 a second is just, once you get used to it, it's a breeze to blow through contracts and read in number codes. Question? Okay, birth certificates. When you are born, the United States government allows you 45 days under trust law, and on the 45th day, you're declared to be a dead person because your name on your birth certificate is nom de guerre. Okay, on that 45th day, they then take your birth certificate and sell it to the Internal Revenue Service and issue all $1 million worth of cash to go into your account. Why do they do that? Because they need money to account for your wages, Medical expenses, automobiles, buying houses, uh, and then accumulated interest to pay for your retirement at 65 through 100. If they don't put a million dollars in cash into a numbering system as a value for the energy of your life, there would never be enough dollars in the system to support the entire planet's operations as the population expands. This is a good thing. Number two, under the redemption, it's called the redemption, which was created by Janet Reno in 1995 under Bill Clinton. Redemption was engineered to capture anybody that would steal money from, the, from this treasury, from this number, and put them in prison for 30 years for bail, mail fraud banking. Why? 
because the redemption program was set up in adverb verb, and if you use adverb verb, you activate the Title 15, Section 1692E, and, and Title 1578FF for a $25 million fine and 30 years in prison for bank fraud. And if you don't study this program, thousands, tens of thousands of people were put in prison for using the redemption and stepping on that, that trap. Lost their homes. Uh, Peterson, Clark, and Schweitzer, Leroy Schweitzer, promoted this thing and went through and harvested over 2,000 families across the South and the West, lost their homes, went to prison. They could, took their farms, their cars, their homes, their pension, everything, put them in prison, which resulted in, for those that are old enough, the Freeman standoff in, in Montana, Montana Freeman, 1995. And guess who prosecuted the 100 FBI agents for fraud and misleading statements on that exercise? I did. I'm the judge. And now the same U.S. attorney that was involved, went up against me in 1995, is involved with the Kansas case I'm involved with on a foreclosure. When my name popped up last week, she went ballistic. <laughs> she says she lost that case in 1995. It was a bird, a burr. You know where birds go. <laughs> and... Uh, as a result of that, she, she is just livid. She wants my head on a, on a stick. I'm going, well, have fun. I says, well, first off, you got a second grade reading level against my 28th grade reading level, and I'm going to have you for breakfast. So it's just a matter of a couple of weeks before we file the indictments against her. Not a question. What happened to the Freeman? Uh, well, here's the state of Montana. Here's, here's uh, where the Freeman were held up. Here's Billings, Montana, and I was right here in Cat Creek. Now, when I showed up in Billings, I got off the plane, and a, a gentleman met me, and he says, come on, we're going over to my, to my ranch. Well, I had corresponded with this man several times. When I got to the ranch, there was about 20 guys with shotguns. And he said, you're going to stay here and write a lawsuit at gunpoint, and you're going to write this lawsuit to get these guys out of trouble up here. Well, it took five days to put together the lawsuit to do it. Then I went on the radio to do a radio show in Billings, Montana, about parse syntax grammar and how the fraud works. The FBI, five minutes after we started broadcasting, blew up all four radio stations in Billings, Montana. So we called another radio station uh, 200 miles away, and we, re we sent out the broadcast, went out on Republican Christian Radio worldwide as to what was going on. <clears throat> 38 miles south of the compound, there is a, a limestone quarry, 125 feet deep. One of the, some of the other free thinkers, I guess you could call them freemen, witnessed two 105 howitzer cannons being moved at night down the country road very quietly. And they set up two 120 millimeter cannons in the quarry. They then evacuated everybody within five miles away of the quarry because they would hear the blast of the cannons when they were fired. The idea was to shoot a shell 20 miles up in the air under a full moon and have it fall down on top of the compound, blowing a hole in the ground 100 feet wide and 50 feet deep, saying they had explosives and blew themselves up, hence solving the problem. In 1820, the area, now Lewis and Clark showed up up here in 1834 on the Yellowstone with Sashagawean. In 1820, an Indian treaty was cut up here with the French. The farm of the freemen had never been ceded into the United States of America, it was a hole in the United States of America under Indian treaty. And this was purchased land. When everything got conquered, the treaty of 1820 was overlooked. So the freemen were sitting on sovereign territory, not part of the United States of America, outside the jurisdiction. It was a hole in America. That's why the FBI came from Puerto Rico, 100 agents were deputized, not of the United States citizenship, and surrounded the compound, but couldn't go in. They couldn't trespass onto a foreign country because they didn't have a permit to be there. These are some of the secrets that you people don't know about, and as a federal judge, I have 
classified information about all this because I handled lawsuits for all this stuff. When it was exposed that the cannons were here, it was my job then to get word to the freeman. The senator from Denver, Colorado shows up and he took nine of my cassette tapes in about grammar and gave it to the freeman. After playing the tapes, they said they realized that their whole entire position and the way they were thinking was a lie. He realized that their treaty, even though they were sovereign within their, this little hole in the world, was also a lie because the treaty was written in adverb verb and didn't, didn't mean anything. And they were also told about the two howitzers, that if you don't walk out before dark, you're not going to walk out anywhere. We're going to put a hole in the ground here. So they surrendered. Now the senator, when he went there from Colorado, we had a button microphone on him. Looks just like a regular button on a suit, but it was actually a, a nickel-sized transmitter with a 300-foot range on it, tied to another mic to a recorder, spike, you know, like a spy camera. And we have him on tape in his voice stating that, I don't care about these people, I'm just here for the show. He says, I'm here to make sure that they all get blowed up. And yet, he on TV, he made a statement that he was there to try and help them get out of here. He was there to orchestrate this thing. What is Denver, Colorado? Mm -hmm. You got Cheyenne Mountain. Cheyenne Mountain is closed. Cheyenne Mountain in 1995 was active, but it was closed right after this. And everything went up to Mount, um, oh, let's see the name of it. They moved, they pulled Cheyenne Mountain out and everything went up to, uh, uh, there's another mountain about 30 miles away. NORAD headquarters were moved over there. I forgot the name of it right now. But anyways, uh, the mine control programs by the Air Force are also up in that same location. In each one of the shootings at all the high schools that took place, also these students came out of, including the last one in Arizona, came, their parents were affiliated with this here and those kids were all part of the brainwashing program. And uh, the minute the kid goes brainwashing grammar, you type in the word grammar, up pops 20 million websites tied to David Wynn Miller. <laughs> and so they tried to hook me up with this whole thing. As far as the Freeman go, uh, they then, when they saw the tapes on grammar, they realized that the FBI had no correct grammar. There was no correct anything. So they threw up their arms and said, okay, take us. And every single, they've charged them with uh, 200 counts on 45-day intervals. And each count was brought to them in adverb verb. The statement is, we are here to participate with the correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar for the avoidance of the perjury. Show us your laws, rules, regulations, and codes with the correct parse, syntax, grammar so we can avoid perjury. Case dismissed. Wait another 45 days and bring one more charge. They've been in jail since 1995. I think Peterson died already, so did, so did uh, Clark, and I heard uh, Schweitzer just recently died. All in prison. Whatever, all being released, because they were always waiting for trial. That's how that happened. But the, the military, as far as these things go, oh, by the way, this... Uh, the senator from Colorado, I missed my plane. I got bumped to another plane in the emergency road. I sat right next to the same senator. I had the tape recording in my hand of what he said in secret to the FBI about killing the Freeman. And I, we played it on the radio <laughs> worldwide. When he, got, when he landed in Denver, Colorado, he was kicked out of the Senate. And I played it for him on the tape. And we had the worst turbulence of the 1,400 flights I've been on in the last 17 years. It was the worst turbulence I had ever been exposed to on a plane. And he got up in this turbulence and got out of his, and changed seats to sit someplace else because he knew who I was and what I was doing and what my position was of getting the Freeman to surrender. And when I played him his own voice back, 
committing treason against the people to kill American citizens. He couldn't stand to face me and got up and left, but we also played it for the population on, on Denver radio and he was kicked out of office when he got back to Denver. What are the odds of me being placed in that location at that exact point in time to, to do all those things? Here's another one for you. I'm in Honolulu, Hawaii, and I missed my plane. I wound up on a 747 in row 47, back of a plane, flying from, it was a nonstop flight from Honolulu to Chicago, Illinois. Lady sitting next to me is, uh, is a school teacher. And her daughter is sitting next to her. She's uh, 18 years old. She's complaining, I'm tired of moving. I'm tired of changing schools all the time. Can't we ever stay in one place? I like says, all my friends live in Honolulu. I'm going, sounds like you get around a lot. She says, yes, my, my, my husband's in the military, and so we have to move all the time. I says, uh, what's your husband's name? Helm. Uh, Admiral Helm. Helm Pacific Fleet Task Force Aircraft Carrier, mm -hmm. Harvey Helm. Mm -hmm. And this is the wife of the, of the admiral who's just been assigned to the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington, D.C. three days earlier. And she was going there to join him and en enroll her daughter in a Florida school for girls. And, uh, and she's an English teacher. Well, Mrs. Helm also has a son in the, in the uh, Navy assigned to the Palestine-Israeli conflict in Europe. And he's over in Europe right now, and this is when Palestine and Israel were shooting at each other. Things were really heated up. Well, Admiral Helm was being transferred from the Pacific Fleet, from the Helm uh, Task Force, to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. What is she doing sitting in row 47 on the back of a 747 with me as a federal judge? Well, the man in front of us is Secret Service, not realizing that Mrs. Helm, we're this far away, speaking quite loud, and he hears this. All of a sudden, like, he collapses and says, oh, I'm having a heart attack. So the stewardess clear off the row directly behind us of five seats and relocate the passengers and other rows. The captain gets on the PA system and says, ladies and gentlemen, we need a, uh, we need a, a heart surgeons. Are there any heart surgeons on board? 400 people on board the plane. Well, they had three heart surgeons on board. So they all came back to the row and they're all standing there looking at this guy and he's complaining of having a heart attack. The captain comes back and he goes like, what are you men doing? He's having a heart attack, service him. He says, we don't have a contract. He says, you don't seem to understand. I'm the captain of an airship in international space. I am the chief cook and bottle washer of this place. You guys will service him or be locked in the brig. So the one doctor goes over and kneels down and takes his blood pressure and pulse, 110 over 70, pulse 72. Sound like anybody with a heart attack? Sound like a pretty healthy man to me. He pulls his guy down, I'm looking through the seats and he whispers something to him. He, perks up and he goes running all the way back. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're gonna have to stop in Los Angeles and, and there's a medical emergency and drop this man off. So we land at the end of the runway in Los Angeles. The whole entire plane is surrounded by black SUVs. Seven guys in black uniforms with no markings on come on board. Five take the immediate seats behind us as the other two guys carry this guy off the plane and we proceed to Chicago. Who were they? They were military secret service to guard Harvey Helm's wife, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Somebody screwed up big time. The point is I had eight hours to teach her parse syntax grammar, to write the Palestine-Israeli Treaty, which I worked with her on, using the United Nations treaties that I had written for the international trade agreements, to give to her, and who does Mrs. Helm sleep with? Joint Chiefs of Staff, Harvey Helm. So therefore, she was able to educate him to go to the Joint Chiefs of Staff and settle the Israeli dispute on parse syntax grammar fraud because they were arguing an adverb verb, not that they had a position of a treaty in quantum language. 72 hours later, you heard that the Palestine-Israeli treaty was signed 
and it's been peace ever since. There's a little Syria rattles their, their, their shingles every now and then, but basically it's been pretty peaceful since then. The world leaders worldwide are studying this technology because they know it is a vehicle to have world peace. So, question. What's that? Uh, I don't know. I've been doing this for 17 years. I can't, I, I couldn't tell you which, which day the, you can probably pull up Harvey Helm in, on, on the internet from the uh, Admiral Helm. Uh, it'll give you a history of his position with the Pacific Fleet when he was transferred to the uh, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington at the Pentagon. That'll cross-reference the exact dates of the Palestine-Israeli conflict. And then you can get your, your treaties from that. I can tell you how to cross-reference things. I don't remember the exact dates myself. So, uh, I, yeah, I've been talking for three hours without giving you guys a minute break here. <laughs> I told you guys, you got to throw something at me after a couple hours. Otherwise, I don't shut up. So, we'll do a lunch break and then, then we'll start back up. Okay. 20 minutes later, so half hour. All right.